I'm excited to be here. It's really great to see uh, not only so many people from all over the country, but uh, the, the depth and breadth of uh, practice that you uh, represent. And so I'm going to focus my presentation on uh, really this partnership concept that uh, uh, Dan, Drew, and uh, Andrea have already addressed. And we'll have some fun looking into that crystal ball. Um, my uh, title is Forecasting the Futures of the Medical Marketplace, Challenges and Opportunities in Billing and Practice Management. And uh, actually, I have 50 years. This is my 50th year full-time in healthcare. I want to leave you with some of the tools that you can take back not only to the practices, but to the partnership that I think we'll develop with Cario. I'm also going to talk to you about the trends that I follow as a person with 50 years experience in healthcare, because the scientific, technological, economic, and political forces that are generating change in the healthcare delivery system are really the things that you need to pay attention to, and I'll give you some hints on what to look for as the foundations for those successful partnerships. And then third, I'm going to talk to you about the imperative for efficiency, in other words, getting waste out of the system, and effectiveness, making sure that the quality of the services for which you all are collectively billing uh, are absolutely top-notch. And for reasons that will be mounted cumulatively in my presentation, you'll see that cost reduction and quality increase are really the keys to success. And you'll also hear me generate a good deal of enthusiasm for success, even though most health futurists are painting a pretty gloomy picture of where you're headed right now. Now that said, um, uh, I really do have a crystal ball, and um, I know how to use it. Um, and to the point that I actually wrote a book uh, three years ago called Upgrading Leadership's Crystal Ball. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a dedicated futurist and believe that the skills are not unique to my training. They can be imparted. And I'm happy to chat with you about uh, those skills in addition to the other topics that come up over the next hour uh, throughout the uh, lunch hour and my 1 o'clock presentation. And I feel a little guilty trying to enlist you to come to the 1 o'clock presentation because I've got two other great presentations uh, um, relating to uh, the partnership that uh, you'll see for reasons that will be clear in my slides uh, energizes me in my presentation to you. But um, this looking in the crystal ball is something I really do. In fact, until um, about 10 years ago, I carried my crystal ball with me and then one overzealous TSA agent tried to confiscate it one day. Fortunately, I was in an airport where I could run out and mail it back to myself, but uh, um, they, they consider a crystal ball a dangerous weapon, I guess, uh, from TSA point of view, but I was not allowed to take it with me. But um, before I talk about uh, the, the background context of politics versus the trends that actually, politics, which makes me glum, by the way. In fact, I, I, I don't usually include this comment, but um, at breakfast today, I was at a couple of different tables, and um, I always love to ask the people I'm going to be speaking with um, what uh, topics do they want me to address and what were they hoping to get from the uh, political presentation, or from the presenters' uh, comments. And uh, one of the comments that came up this morning is, well, we want to find out if you're on the Republican or the Democrat side. And let me be crystal clear, I'm on neither. I don't think either one has a clue. And so I'm counting on you to generate the change in the healthcare delivery system. But we'll get back to that. Uh, but um, I want to leave you with considerable enthusiasm, but also assure you up front that my presentation, what you're about to see, the content and the pluses and minuses of the future that I will uh, reveal to you from my crystal ball, um, were in no way vetted by Cario. Um, I submitted my slides at the last moment. They never said, let's get online and tell Bauer what to say. So you are getting my unvarnished view. Now, that can lead to anxiety from my point of view. I make my living giving speeches all around the country to audiences like this one. But um, when I know that I'm going to be preceded by um, the CEO of the company, the director of sales relationships, uh, the, the chief technology officer and the like, there's always a uh, possibility to say, ooh, how am I going to backtrack on that point? Maybe I should skip that slide because it contradicts. There's total congruence. So I have not in any way um, tried to mesh my views. Um, you could go to any of my many writings or uh, talk to people that have heard me in my other presentations around the country over the last couple of years and find out I am not tailoring my message for this audience, but this is as comfortable an audience as I could have. Your idea of partnerships, your visions of the changes taking place in the payment of health care are totally congruent with mine. So I'm going to leave here uh, with considerable excitement and hopefully with some good discussions with you. I'll be here through the lunch hour. I will be here at the 1 o'clock presentation. Can linger after that a little bit if need be. So don't hesitate to engage me.
and let's look at it as a two-way exchange. I can learn from you as much as you can learn from me. But what you've probably learned from most health futures, since I expect you attend conferences all over the country, and you've heard the half dozen or so friendly competitors that also give speeches about the changes taking place in the medical marketplace, most will focus on the political reforms. And indeed, probably more than half of the requests I get from clients, from speakers bureaus, like, well, can you tell people what's going to happen in the now 2020 presidential election? What are the implications of single payer? Um, is Congress going to do anything? And I'll throw in a few slides towards the end of government, policy, uh, government um, programs that are taking place or not taking place in healthcare. But most political futures tend to focus on the politics. I believe that's totally misdirected. I really think the future of healthcare, the good future of healthcare, a distinction you'll hear in just a moment, comes from what you all do collectively and in partnerships. So again, all the slides at the end of my presentation, my summaries of what I lay out as the best ways for the success of all the parties in this audience comes from partnerships, not from politics often indeed from partnerships that will challenge the political realities, but we'll get there. What I really have focused on in my 50 years of healthcare is the realm of possibilities. What can the health professionals that bring you all to the room, what can they do to make us a healthier country? What can they do to improve the value of our 17% um, of GDP that we spend on healthcare. And so the focus has been so nicely made by Dan, Drew, and Andrea to, to talk about how you're going to help the clinical enterprise. That really is what matters. So I want to talk about the possibilities for you all working together to make better clinical care, less expensive clinical care, the outcome of the system, because that's really where they, it wants to take us. Now, I am frequently interviewed by the press. I get calls from journalists. Uh, um, at least monthly, saying, hey, Bauer, wh where's healthcare going? And they're startling, starting to pick up with healthcare becoming a major issue in the Democratic primaries. And uh, I have my standard uh, uh, response to that is first of all, it's going to be very different. Don't assume for a second that healthcare five to 10 years from now will look like it does today. And I'll elaborate many of those differences. But be uncertain about what those differences are going to be. Most people would say, all right, now Bauer, tell us what the differences are going to be. And you'll hear, I believe there's going to be a range of differences and I'm excited about how partnerships can create the good ones. It's going to be highly diverse. There will be no such thing as the way to have a medical group or other health professional organization uh, work in this country. We will see the proliferation of models, again, part of what excites me, and was clearly implied in Dan's comments about looking for the winning things to do. I'm going to talk about some losers in just a moment, too, but if you focus on being the winners and doing that collectively, uh, some neat things are going to happen. But I also want to stress that it's going to be chaotic. Chaos is uh, this wonderful event that uh, we have to get used to. Quite frankly, from the 70s through about the 90s, just before the uh, two decades that uh, Dan chronicled in his presentation, healthcare was pretty stable in this country. I'd say by the end of the last century, I was thinking about going into real estate or stock markets or something exciting because things weren't uh, very, uh, uh, very tumultuous, but they sure are now. So does anybody have trouble with me using chaos to describe the future of healthcare? I should hope not because I'll give you the dictionary definition of chaos, the state in which chance, meaning you know, the luck of the draw, the toss of the dice is supreme, utter confusion, wantonly uh, a wanting order, um, lacking order, um, no necessary law that makes uniformity the outcome. But what I love is the last of the definitions in Webster's Dictionary, the confused unorganized state before the creation of distinctly organized forms. Human history is an ebb and flow of progress, problems, progress, problems. And I think we're entering one of the most problematic periods one could imagine in healthcare. I'm also very excited that history says, from our approach to those problems, we can create some order for a while. So even though I think we're going to enter a couple of the most tumultuous years we've ever seen, those of you that work to develop a better system, beginning with the platforms, the partnerships, the relationships, are going to do some neat things that could make healthcare by the middle of the next decade um, pretty stable and actually something that uh, um, uh, lets you sleep a little better at night. So uh, I don't look at this as uh, hell in a handbasket and uh, Chicken Little saying the sky is going to fall. I look at this as our wonderful opportunity to create something new that'll stick around for a while, quite frankly, until medical science reinvents itself. We'll look at that too. 
Now, best way to predict your future is to create it. If you Google that, um, most of the Google hits will say that Abraham Lincoln said it. And it doesn't quite seem to me like a thing Abraham Lincoln would have said, but that's what comes up. But um, if you Google Abraham Lincoln, you can find one of his other quotes. You really can't trust the authenticity of everything you find on the internet. <laughs> so, but the spirit matters, uh, and, and, and that's really important. And in fact, um, uh, when I was in college, I had um, a poster and a painting, and the painting is on my last slide. But the poster that I had um, 55 years ago as a college freshman um, was this statement by Confucius, surely we will end up where we are headed if we do not change direction. And where we are headed is pretty gloomy. Um, I could stand here and make the case that healthcare really is falling apart and none of you have a chance. I won't do that because I don't believe that. But if we do change direction and we do that together, we can create some really neat things. And, and that's the Confucian saying. I can also tell you, celebrating my 50th year as a full-timer in healthcare, that um, uh, we're going to see more change in this 10-year period uh, that we're really entering right now than we have seen at any time in the previous 50 years. And that's not idle speculation on my part. Um, I started in healthcare 50 years ago, and I've seen every single one of those changes that lies as a backdrop to the presentation I'm about to lay out on you. But um, you're probably wondering then, well, how does Bauer talk about the future? Uh, what, um, what is his foundation methodologically for sharing with you a vision of four trends and their likely outcomes and ways that you can harness them or avoid them to have a better future for yourselves? And obviously, when you think about the future, the first word that probably comes to mind is, well, I'll predict the future. And um, that makes sense um, because we uh, use that terminology in that uh, context all the time. Well, a prediction, the standard textbook definition of a prediction is a uh, statement, a specific estimate of the predicted value of a key variable at a future point in time. So it's telling you what some value will be, which could be the total volume of healthcare services uh, um, that goes through the practices you all collectively represent. It could be the shortage of doctors. It could be the uh, spending on um, uh, emergency departments. You know, it's something that you want to know five years from now, what will we be doing? What market target do we need to take into our own thinking, uh, looking some number of years out? So there's a classic textbook definition of a prediction. Well, how do you make a prediction? Let me go through this very quickly, um, because you've all done it even if you didn't realize it. First of all, you decide what do you want to predict, um, revenue that uh, our medical group will generate, um, the uh, um, billings of this physical therapy organization, uh, the number of people that will demand services from an anesthesiology group. You want to know five years from now what's it going to be. Well, first of all, you figure out what's the value you want. I just gave you examples. Then you figure out what's explained it in the past. You go out and collect data about those factors, um, percentage of people with insurance, um, average copay, all of the things that might factor into that. And then you look at all of your data and find the equation that best fit that relationship. And then you simply take that equation apply it to the data you've got, extrapolate it out into the future, and see what value it predicts five years from now, 10 years from now, 90 days from now, whatever the case may be. So that's a prediction. It's based very carefully on mathematical analysis, on finding the best mathematical fit. You all have done it frequently when you opened up Excel and did a multiple regression analysis or some sort of exponential smoothing technique. Uh, um, you are predictors in, in your own uh, daily practice. But as long as you can find the mathematical relationship that best explained things in the past, you have the tool to look at in the future um, and to extend that to find out what the value is going to be. Well, um, that's a problem in healthcare. And in fact, it was a real problem for Barack Obama when he became president of the United States in January of 2009. He brought across from Congress to be from who the guy that was the uh, director of the Congressional Budget Office to now become the director of the budget for the White House, a guy named Peter Orzog, who has exactly the same professional training that I have. Um, Peter and I would have been taught exactly the same tools for making predictions. And you might remember that Obama, to get the presidential nomination from the Democratic Party, battled Hillary Clinton um, uh, on the issue of health reform. Clinton wanted massive health reform. Obama said, nothing doing. I don't want health reform at all. We have more important things to do. 
When he became president, he sat down with Peter Orzog, and Orzog said, you know, I just published this article in the um, uh, Journal of the Social Security Administration, and it says that healthcare is going to go from roughly 15% of GDP as it was in 2008 when he did his analysis to 20% of the GDP in uh, 2015. So looking six years ahead, he told Obama, healthcare is going to eat up all the money. If we don't do something about healthcare, we're not going to have any money to do the other things that you would like to accomplish as president. So that and a few other political shenanigans convinced Obama to do something he said as a candidate he wouldn't do. And so he put all of his eggs into the basket of health reform in 2009 and 2010, passed the Affordable Care Act, which has been one of the biggest cans of worms, uh, uh, I think, that we've seen in a long time. If anyone wants equal time, uh, well, let, 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 me, let me make my case, and then um, uh, I'd be surprised if any of you loved it all that much, uh, at least in trying to implement it. And I've got some slides to make that point in a moment. But uh, that was because Peter Orzog made the prediction that healthcare was going to go from 15% of GDP to 20% of GDP in six years, and Obama had to do it. Well, what did healthcare do between 2009 and 2015? And since the Affordable Care Act didn't go into a place until the third quarter of 2014, it had nothing to do with this trend. It only went up to 17.3% of GDP. It didn't rise that much at all. So the prediction was flat out wrong, and it generated all this government policy that's vexed us, um, you know, caused uh, really no particular progress. None of the data suggests that we're better off in this country with our health care system with or without uh, the Affordable Care Act. But the, the, the prediction was flat out wrong. Now, you might say, oh, I'm being political biased. I must be a Republican. Well, I can go back and show you the things that George Bush did as president. I can go back and show you what Bill Clinton did as president. Go all the way back to H.W. Bush, George's dad, and show you the government policies that they based on government predictions. Not a single one of them was correct. I've actually written on that, and nobody's ever taken me to task. So predictions are a real problem. This is why every year at uh, the end of the year, um, just before um, uh, New Year's Day, the Wall Street Journal, and this, this, I'm not making this up, the Wall Street Journal pretty much publishes the same article and says, you know, the, the, all the predictions were wrong. At the beginning of the year, here was the prediction for what the Dow Jones would be. Here was the prediction for what the price of oil would be. Here's the prediction for how many physicians would be in practice. Go through all these pictures and they were all wrong. Well, the Wall Street Journal, um, always publishes the same graphic of the dart thrower. And that's because every year they actually do hire um, some experts to come in and predict about a half dozen uh, um, key variables of the US economy. And then they throw darts at numbers on a board. And here's the, uh, the difference. Um, if you look at what the experts are, um, that's the one on your left. And um, you see how far off they were? On the right is the dartboard, and the dartboard did a better job picking the winners. So, and I'm not making any of this up. This, this is not a politically biased comment one bit. And by the way, um, you know, the Wall Street Journal is not the uh, only source that does this. And indeed, the lead writer for the New York Times, Robert Samuelson, who is not only a Pulitzer Prize winning economist himself, but the son of a Nobel Prize economist. Um, this was his take at the, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Economists don't know what they're talking about because our predictions are flat out wrong. And uh, say, I've had the delight as an economist doing that, but you might think, therefore, that I'm against my science. Well, not so at all. Being the author of two books on predictive science for, econo for economists, uh, with particularly uh, a focus on medical economists, I can assure you that good predictions can be made when the quantifiable relationships are rep that represented how things worked in the past are going to represent how things are going to work in the future. But can you think of anything in healthcare that's going to work five years from now the way it did today? I'm going to give you four trends to show you scientifically it won't, technologically it won't, economically it won't, and politically it won't. So the necessary stability behind predictive science causes me, a PhD medical economist, to totally reject it. Yeah, I can't do it. Anybody want equal time for making predictions in healthcare? I'm happy to hear them. And um, as an economist, you know, I'm used to, obviously, you know, since we never know what we're talking about, I'm used to them being wrong. Um, so how can you look at that? How could I feel good selling my services uh, carry out to come talk to you about the future of healthcare if I'm admitting that my professional foundation is worthless. Well, in the rapidly changing healthcare system, it's worthless. So, what can we do? Uh, how can providers, the people whose 
financial interests you are managing, um, purposefully anticipate and prepare for change. Well, there's the art of forecasting. And forecasting is totally different. In fact, we generally tend to think of predicting and forecasting as being synonyms, but they are not. A prediction is, as you already saw, a specific point estimate based on mathematics. A forecast is an estimate of the probabilities of possibilities. Now, you might ask, how in the world can Bauer, an economist, have expertise in making forecasts? Because what do you associate forecasts with? Who, get, who does forecasts? Weatherman, yeah. Well, guess what I was before I went into healthcare? I was a weatherman. No joke. You might wonder why 50 years ago in the summer of 1969 did I stop working for the National Center for Atmospheric Research and start working for a 400-bed cancer hospital. It was because I was a weatherman first. In fact, my very first published scientific article is titled Comments on the Ground Observation of the Formation of Hailstones and Cumulonimbus Clouds. And you, it, it appears in the November 1967 issue of the Journal of Atmospheric Physics. So I actually have legitimate credentials in being a weatherman. It was because I learned how to do large-scale data and analytics that a hospital hired me to come in and help them start setting up data collection. And that's why I was so excited to hear the, day, the attention to data collection and what I've heard so far in this presentation this morning. So I know something about forecasting. I can tell you the, S, the, the textbook definition of a forecast is an estimate of the probabilities of possibilities for a key variable. And that's not the same as a specific value. And so how do you look at a forecast? Well, you don't have any fancy mathematics at all. You simply figure out, um, did it rain or did it snow or was it a nice, beautiful day on any given day? And then you look at the weather factors that cause rain or snow or a clear blue day, which happen to be the water, the relative humidity, how much moisture is in the air, the wind that blows it around, the temperature that influences whether it's going to be come down as something frozen, and the atmospheric pressure. So what you do to make a forecast is you look at the four variables that explain the past outcome. Somebody at KNX this morning got up and said, all right, uh, what's the forecast for this afternoon? And so what they did was they took the relative humidity, the atmospheric pressure, the wind, and um, uh, the temperature, and they looked for the. La they just said to the computer, "Find me the last hundred days that started out with exactly the same values of those four variables." And then they went to the afternoon on the four days that were just like today, and lo and behold, if on 30 of those four of those uh, last hundred days it rained, there's your 30 percent chance of rain. No math, just looking, observing how things change, but. Here's the key. If the factors that influence how wind, temperature, uh, moisture, and pressure all come together change, in other words, if the climate changes, that's climate is the set of factors that determines how the weather variables interact. If that changes, you have to come up, with, you'll expect to come up with different probabilities than what you saw. So I'm now going to lead you into looking at the changes in the four trends that define the future of healthcare, which explains why it's going to be chaotic and give you the foundations for doing some really good things in partnerships that have been discussed by the three great speakers in front of me and the ones that will follow. Any questions or comments at this stage? Everybody with me? In other words, throw out anybody that tells you, here's the trend analysis in healthcare. That's gloomy. That'll get you nowhere. And get excited about what you can create looking at the new computer technologies that you can adapt, which Andrea laid out very nicely in her presentation, the new payment schemes that were a big part of, uh, of Dan's comments, um, the overviews that, uh, um, uh, that um, were, were included in uh, um, really all three presentations. Okay, so that's where I want to take us in my remaining time here, is to look at the possibilities with the understanding that one size doesn't fit all. And again, in the preceding presentations and looking at what Cario offers, because I did walk around and uh, look at the different stations before uh, the session started this morning, look at where the winners are going to be and focus on that. You can't do one thing that's going to solve everybody's problems. In fact, you're going to hear me give a forecast in just a second, saying some people aren't going to make it. Because I, like one of the physicists that I knew back in my research meteorology atmospheric physics days, don't think of myself as predicting things. To quote uh, Freeman Dyson, who's um, 98 and still teaching at Princeton, um, he wrote an article about 10 years ago that said, futurists, forecasters, predict, or don't predict, they express possibilities, things that could happen. To a large extent, it's a question of how badly you want them to happen. So that goes back to the Abraham Lincoln spirit. You know, if you want a future, create it. Get in there and create this together. And that's where I'll lead us with what we're doing. Now, here's my five-year forecast. 
Uh, this is not saying that healthcare will be 17.3% of GDP for five, year, five or six years from now. This is saying that there's a 10% chance of growth. Now, most people assume healthcare is a growth industry. It's grown from 4.5% of GDP in 1965 when Medicare and Medicaid were created to roughly 17.3% today. Um, things haven't changed much lately. So the idea that healthcare is going to continue on that long run trend that we saw in Peter Orzog's data, I just find untenable. In fact, um, one of the best known health futurists, Uwe Reinhardt, who unfortunately died um, about a year ago, um, Uva, when he first heard me make this presentation at a scientific meeting in Chicago about six, seven years ago, he said, Jeff, in fact, he came up to me afterwards in his very clever way, he said, Jeff, goodbye, it's been fun knowing you. I said, well, what's wrong, Uva? And he said, um, well, nobody's going to believe that healthcare is not a growth industry. Healthcare will continue to grow. It'll be 25% of GDP by, um, you know, 2020 next year. And I said, well, no, I really think that the growth has stopped. Well, I saw him about two years ago, not too long before he died, and he came up to me again, and he says, Jeff, and I said, hey, Uva, I'm still here. And he says, do you still believe healthcare is no longer going to be a growth item? It's, it's, it's stabilized? And I said, yes. And he looked me square in the eye, and he said, you optimist. <laughs> so I'm not giving you heresy. Those of us that look at these data think, you know, we've quit spending money on healthcare, and I'll get to that in just a moment. I think the most likely outcome is stagnation, and that really influences the final uh, recommendations that I'll give to you, which reinforce my view that the partnerships uh, you all are here to, uh, to negotiate are the foundation of the good futures. And I think there's a 40% chance of decline. And I got to tell you, I'm really on the fence. I might switch those last two. I might say 40% chance of stagnation and 50% chance of decline. I don't think the money is there for healthcare to grow. Now, I get excited about that because that's going to force us to get serious about cutting out the waste, but that's my concluding comment. Now, what about people that are in healthcare? Be they billing agencies or be they um, medical groups, uh, physical therapy organizations, um, health insurance plans, the people in your sphere, be they um, hospitals and health systems that uh, you contract with, um, anybody in healthcare. Um, so I'm not just talking about hospitals. Anybody that makes part of that 17.3% of GDP, what's their five-year prospect? I think 25% are going to fail. In other words, failure is not only an option, I think it's a certainty in healthcare. And so you want to be real careful to make sure you're not one of the uh, potential failures. Um, it doesn't mean that they'll necessarily liquidate. A lot will. Um, hospitals are starting to close down right and left. And uh, five years ago when hospitals were facing um, rough times, uh, the, the issue was who are we going to sell to? Who's going to buy us? Within the last couple of months, several hospitals have closed with no buyers. You know, so that's happening around the country. So it's, it's not just, oh, we're going to lose our independence and somebody else will take us over. It's going out of business. So I've got a real gloomy view for about one in four in healthcare. Anybody want to challenge that? Anybody say, oh, no, everybody's got guaranteed key to success? Anybody want to? Okay. Well, 40% um, are going to continue to operate as they are precariously. The CEO and the CFO won't drive to work worried about closure that week. But they won't be real excited about the next couple of years because their main preoccupation is going to be continuing to maintain a constant level of, uh, of revenue. <coughs> that leaves the 35% that are going to reinvent healthcare, really do exciting things that are going to be made possible by the kinds of configurations and systems that Andrea talked about and by um, uh, the, the overview that Drew gave you at the beginning, reimagining what you all could do together. And I say that I, didn't pan I did not know they were going to say that. I sat in the audience and heard it for the first time you did today, but it's totally consistent with the message I'm giving to hospital boards of directors and medical staff leaders and, and people that own medical groups all around the country, is if you move with the times and lead in new and different directions, I think we're going to thrive and I, I would stay in healthcare. So I think the growth in healthcare has ended, which you might read as gloomy, but hear me loud and clear. The new trends, when properly managed, are going to produce good outcomes, more good outcomes than bad ones. Is that a pretty good message? And so that should energize you to grasp the opportunities before you to work together to reinvent healthcare. Now let me talk about why, because the climate has changed. The set of factors that influence how the dollars flow through the healthcare system, the equivalent of rain or no rain in wherever you live, is changing. The climate of healthcare is different. So I'm going to look at the four new climates of healthcare very briefly and uh, try to convince you that uh, uh, sensitivity to these changes 
will allow you to reinvent things and to go in totally new and different directions, which quite frankly, and I want to be real clear on this, neither the Democrats nor the Republicans get. I cannot sh find a shred of attentiveness to what really excites me about the future of healthcare right now in either party's political discussions of healthcare. But I can find lots of opportunities for you to use these things and to develop the better systems to be part of that 35% that's going to thrive in your own marketplaces. We'll get there. But there's a revolution in medical science. We'll go into each of these for a couple of minutes each. A revolution in medical science. It's redefining what your medical groups and your other provider organizations are going to do. In other words, the 20th century function of having a medical service for which bills need to be issued is very different than what it was in the 20th. Very different. Information and communications technologies make me real excited about uh, engineering these changes. In other words, if it weren't for the kinds of systems that uh, Andrea talked about uh, evolving and, and that Dan included in his three-segment view of the last uh, 20 years, um, if it weren't for these technologies, I'd be pretty glum. I would say we're, uh, we are going to hell in a handbasket. I think the end of growth in spending, in other words, my 10% or less chance of things continuing to grow, is going to force us to redefine the provider-patient relationship. But fortunately, there are good ways to do that. And the problems with government-driven reform are going to compel us to do it on our own. In other words, I will state categorically that if you wait for Washington to tell you what to do, you're going to be in the 25%, in my personal opinion. Anyone see that differently? You don't have to agree with that, but uh, um, I get real excited, though, in the clues you all can put together and what you can do. Well, let's look at that, the revolution in medical science. Um, we're moving from the one-size-fits-all clinical paradigm of the 20th century to one that really focuses on the difference in patients. And um, this whole idea of personalizing medicine, uh, precisely looking at uh, what we think are the most likely outcomes for an individual patient, looking at the value of their genetic structures and, and the epigenetic factors, the environments in which they live, whether they smoke, how much they drink. And I am a wino, as I said, so it's not an anti-alcohol uh, anti comment. Um, you know, the, the, whether you exercise, avoid sugar, all of the things that we've learned in the last 10 to 15 years not only ultimately determine health, but determine, um, uh, you know, based on our own individual genetic differences and our environmental and behavioral factors, those are the exciting things to be looking at. And I didn't, again, I didn't coordinate with Andrea at all in this, but I'm sure that she's well sensitive because she talked about looking into clinical records and starting help the clinicians understand these things. We are going to be doing that for individuals for whose billings we are, you know, accounts we are responsible. And so that gets real exciting. We're going to be focused on population health because one of the biggest shifts that I've seen as we've moved from the 20th century to the 21st is in the 20th century, we were just focused on trying to get healthcare spending under control. That was the focus of every single health reform. We're spending too much on healthcare, got to figure out a way to spend less. Cur you know, um, tame the, the curve on healthcare spending. Well, today we realize that's not the real challenge. The real challenge is getting a bang for our buck because we in the United States spend twice as much money as the average country in the other, of the other 34, 33 members of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. All of the developed Western countries belong to a thing called OECD. And OECD kept, keeps the best health records, comparative health records, of any organization. And the OECD shows that we in the United States spend 17.3% of our GDP on health care. It also shows that the average for the other countries is a slightly more than half that. It's about 9.8 to 10, 10.2%. So we're spending almost twice as much on health care. Now, in terms of health of the population, you look at all the statistics that measure how healthy people are, we are the most expensive by almost a factor of two of the 34 countries that are just like us. Where are we in health? If you rank us by all the health, we're last. We spend the most, we are the least healthy of the 34 countries. So health policy has shifted to making sure what do we do to improve the health? Well, to improve the health, we have to individualize things. We don't treat everybody the same. The idea of standards of practice and textbook care, that's so 20th century. We need to individualize our care down to the patients to help them change their behaviors 
base their consumption of drugs, the surgical procedures they undergo, on our knowledge of how that fits with their genetic indicators and a whole list of other things. So healthcare is becoming very individualized. And so it's focusing on the outcomes, something that the speakers in front of me already addressed, that is why I didn't have to change any of my slides, or quite frankly have to backpedal on any of the things that I said, because we're, we're talking the same language here. Cost-effective care, meaning that for the dollar spent, you get the best outcome, which by the way, we are also the bottom there. In fact, the latest OECD study, this really blows my mind, says that for every additional dollar we spend in healthcare in the United States right now, our health declines. Did you know that the health of the average American is declining right now? It is, I'm not making that up. I can show you the government statistics there in my latest book. But um, uh, we're, we're spending a little bit more on healthcare and we're getting less healthy. Germany, on the other hand, for every euro that it spends on healthcare, is actually finding perceptible improvements in, its, in the health of its population, as are Denmark and France and a few other countries. So we have to work on that. And that means, again, individualizing the care. But how we're going to do that is with patient care center teams. So one of the things that excites me the most, and this will be a foundation of my afternoon presentation, if it's the will of the group. We've left that intentionally un understructured, if you will, so that I can engage you in dialogue on what interests you the most. But if you are interested, I want to talk to you about my considerable excitement about the future of the uh, non-physician practitioners, what I am urging you strongly to call advanced practitioners. Trust me, this will be real clear if you attend my afternoon presentation. Don't ever again use the term mid-level practitioner because the nurse practitioners, the clinical pharmacists, the PhD psychologists are now equally qualified to physicians. And if you doubt that, I've read a, written a whole book on it. I am firmly convinced that the future of healthcare could be very good in this country if we would do a better job using our doctorates in physical therapy. By the way, I was really happy to see the percent of your business coming from physical therapy. Um, PT is, is going on gangbusters. As our clinical pharmacists, as I say in the book, by the way, I think we're not too many years away from the point where pharmacists will be billing for their services. In other words, you see a drug ad on TV to say, ask your doctor. No, you should be asking your pharmacist because the pharmacists have several times more training in the use of drugs for meeting any physical condition than any physician. It's, it's remarkable. And I say, I got over 400 footnotes in this book, so this is not me taking idle things. And even, I even sent letters to the AMA saying, if you have any evidence to the contrary, would you please let me know? Because the AMA doesn't like pharmacists changing meds. The AMA doesn't like physical therapists taking care of lower back pain, you know, all of those things. And my two letters to the AMA were un unanswered. But I found 400 refereed peer-reviewed journals that um, show that the future is going to belong. And there's another reason that I encourage you as you develop your partnerships to think very seriously about the future of billing and practice management and the other array of services that Andrea talked about. The other reason to think about the use of advanced practice nurses, including nurse midwives and CRNAs, and uh, physical therapists and clinical pharmacists and the like. The other reason is there not going to be any growth in the number of doctors. The, the supply of physicians is actually declining in this country. So if we're going to meet the growing needs for healthcare, we're going to have to meet it with these advanced practitioners. And as I say, I'm firmly convinced that they are as good as physicians in the, in the things that they do in common. So information and communications technologies. I'm really excited about what our robust information and communications technologies can do. We often just talk about IT, but we should be talking about ICT, as the Europeans all do, because the C for communications, meaning our cell phones, you know, our smartphones and all these neat communicating things that we've got, that's the wave of the future. And again, I saw that clearly embedded in where the Cario platforms are going, the kinds of examples that I saw as I walked out and looked at things. You get it, now you just have to work together to implement it and to make sure you get paid for it. But we'll get there in just a moment because that's next. The integrated EHR systems. Now, I'm really disenchanted with the EHR systems we've got. Um, I refer, um, uh, um, Dan in his presentation referred to it as the law does to meaningful use. I refer to it as meaningless use. Because in my opinion, all we did with the, 20, with, with, uh, the High Tech Act, you know, that was this 43 billion, and it probably cost more like 65 billion um, to get everybody, or not everybody, but vast number of people up to uh, meaningful use. I think it was money down the drain. All it really did was allowed us to, to, to really standardize the 20th century concept of the medical record rather than develop a new medical record for the 21st century. So Andrea, I would hope, and I saw, I saw clear evidence of that, 
that you're going to look about developing the right data. Um, one of the tables I sat at for breakfast this morning, accurate data came up. Oh, that's speaking my language. Make sure the numbers are correct. Because we spend an enormous amount of time processing inaccurate data. You know that. I don't even ask for a show of hands. So we need better electronic records. I firmly believe that the electronic record is essential. We're not going to have good health care without the electronic record. But it's got to be a different electronic health record than the one we've got. And I live in Madison, Wisconsin, home of, uh, um, you know, Epic. Um, virtual technologies. I, I stopped and practically applauded as I was walking along, and I saw that telemedicine is one of the services Cario provides. I, I'm going to sound like I got a I got a problem writing books because I have written a book about telemedicine. And I believe, I believe as strongly in telemedicine as I believe in advanced practitioners. We are not going to have a good healthcare delivery system without telemedicine. We should be doing, and I firmly believe this, and I say it even in the advanced practice book, 30% of our patient interaction should be electronic. 30%. And it should be built into the cost structure. And you, as partners in the billing, and in and, and practice delivery thing should be integrating that in so that no practitioner group can say, well, we'd like to do telemedicine, but we won't get paid for it. Redesign the healthcare delivery system. I'll include that in my final, my final comments. And network technologies. And again, I'm speaking to the choir here because I looked at what's being done out here. We got voice recognition. You've got um, uh, kiosks, all mentioned right out there, built in already um, to the actual and planned uh, platforms carry on. Again, I didn't, they didn't vet my slides. I didn't even know this until I got here. I had my pitch and then I saw that it's happening, but it's going to happen as you all as partners. So that said, I get real excited about technology. Take it very seriously. With wine, to, if you are able to drink wine, of course. Um, and a growth in healthcare spending. Let me quickly talk about the implications of that because I firmly believe that governments, state, local, and national, um, have reached, and employers, who collectively have for the last 45 years paid 82 to 85 percent of all health care bills. They're not going to pay anymore. Do any of you know a single employer or a single government agency that wants to spend more on health care? I don't. Not one. Everybody wants to spend less. And by the way, one of the things that irritates me the most is anyone saying, well, we ought to have um, uh, Medicare for all because Medicare is so efficient. It only spends 8 percent. Well, no, this is, I'm not making this up. I, uh, I'm, writing, I'm writing an article. Oh, this is terrible. Would somebody find the drug that would prevent me from writing another article? It would make my wife very happy. You've seen me walking around with her probably. She came to breakfast this morning. You'll see me with her this afternoon. So tell my wife, hey, we got this drug your husband ought to be taking because it'll prevent him from writing a book. But, uh, and marijuana is not yet legal in Wisconsin, so I got to be careful. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, even though it is in California. Um, so um, any event, I, I just, you know, I, and I'm not smoking anything. I really, I am drinking, but not smoking. Um, I really believe that, um, uh, that we're not going to see any more money. And Medicare is inappropriately uh, given some credit by Bernie Sanders and some other Democratic candidates for having cut the cost of health care. No. Congress cut the appropriations, and all Medicare could do was find out ways to make it difficult to give you money. Anyone want a different point of view on that? Again, I'm an economist. I'm a weatherman. I got to be careful. I got two strikes against me. Anyone in the audience disagree with that statement? Me Medicare, <laughs> I, I think Medicare only exists, only gets credit because it's done what Congress did. Congress simply has cut hundreds of billions of dollars out of the 10-year long-term plan. And so all they've done is find out ways to be stingier. Anyone disagree with that? I don't see any brilliance in Medicare and how to have a better health care delivery system. Am I OK here? Please, hammer me now, because I could be wrong. Um, therefore, and it, here's something that the Republicans and Democrats both agree on. Um, we've got to move from fee for service which is probably why we have 17.3% of our GDP going to health care, um, to value-based payment, paying you because the people who benefit from your services are healthier. And I've sure got a lot of evidence about healthier people coming from nurse practitioner groups and clinical pharmacists and the like. Um, so again, put all these together and you can do some neat things. But they expect providers to share risk. What an incredible challenge to find the right way to share risk, which, and I'll conclude with a comment from just last week's, um, uh, I'll conclude with a comment from just last week's, uh, um, one of healthcare reviews um, that's nationally published, is we've got to do this. And demand is going to change. As we expect patients to pay more, um, they're going to change what they want to get out of healthcare, but they don't have any increased income. 
the interesting fact, it was only February of this year where consumer disposable income came back up to what it was at the end of 2007 before the 2008 recession. In other words, for the average American, they had less money to spend on everything until February of this year than they did at the end of 2007. And it's only crept up just a little bit, so we need to deal with that. And then there's the government. And I'm, I'm not even going to go through these, you know, bullet by bullet. Um, uh, I, I, my mom was, my, I grew up in a small town in Wyoming, and my mom was my kindergarten teacher. And I learned in kindergarten, if you don't have something nice to say about something, Jeff, don't say anything. And I've already violated that a bit, but I don't have anything really nice to say about government, and they know that. And, and interestingly enough, I go to Washington fairly often, and my friends in the government say, you know what I really hate about you, Bauer? I mean, I really despise you. You know why? Deep down inside, I think you're probably right. So uh, sorry if that seems self-aggrandizing. But um, I don't think we have a political prayer in the world of getting any meaningful health care reform out of Washington. I don't think it matters who gets elected. In terms of health care, my excitement comes from what you can do collectively. And I'm excited because I know you can do things. You've already seen evidence of that out there in today's presentations, the speakers that are going to follow me, and the neat things that you're doing already in your practices. Regulations, as we'll see in just a moment, are very unlikely to be implemented as passed. I want to go through that. But are you confused? Have I confused you about the future of healthcare? It's really neat. Um, we lived in Chicago until about two years ago and uh, just decided Madison would be a better place for me to be a struggling artist. So, um, uh, but we always used to take our vacations over in the western shore of Michigan and um, we'd drive south from Chicago fairly frequently on um, what's called the Skyway. Anybody know the Skyway? It's this big funnel when you go out of Chicago. And it's got 12, count them, 12 toll booths. And I think as an experiment, we've been through them all. And the reason I have the experiment is that it, just before you go through it, it has this sign. And it says, confuse, pull ahead, and press the help button. We've been through eight of the 12, and there's not a single help button there. <laughs> there is no help button. OK. So, um, so what you have to do is figure this out on your own. I think that's a metaphor. Uh, did any of you know, could you, do any of you have a friend at CMS that you can call and say, hey, would you tell me how to solve this problem? I'm serious. No, they'll have another problem to make it worse. So, okay, well, here's the, the slide that I promised a moment ago. Probably my favorite healthcare writer, uh, in other words, I found him most reliable over following his work for many years, just said just last week, in fact, this came out the day I was putting these slides together, and so I was able to include it, is CMS making a blunder in physician payment? Well, Mark's comment is CMS basically stated that last week, that, and this is last week, with reference to right now, that the original terms of participation in MIPS would now be uh, altered considerably. You all hear that news? Do you trust them one bit? They tell you what they're going to do, they change it. I mean, the programs, that's been the same with, with Obamacare, by the way, the ACA has something. So it is very significant, uh, to go a little further into Mark's analysis here, it's very significant that CMS is creating a disturbance among the leaders of the most advanced physician groups. Did any of you, do any of you work with physician groups that were excited about CMS? Um, uh, not only change, saying that, that MIPS will be very different, but they don't even know what it's going to be different. Anybody excited? Okay, i rest my case. And then Mark goes on to conclude, is this a sign of things to come, or can the CMS find a way to meet providers at least halfway to achieve the goals that they themselves frame publicly? Only time will tell. I don't think it's going to happen. Am I wrong? Can you do it? Yes. There's a the whole point. You can work in local partnerships. So let's look at that. You need to fix the way care is delivered. We need to become efficient, which means cut the waste out of health care. And we need to become effective, which means deliver a good health care service, prove that the drug actually made the patient better, the patient benefited from the surgical intervention. Right now, we just bill, and we don't look as to whether we did any good or not. And I've already told you the national and international data show that we get less money by spending more, or we get less health by spending more money on health care. We've got to stop that. 25% aren't going to do it, and they're going to be out of business. 35% are going to develop the databases and the like and get it accomplished, and, and that really gets me excited. Now, is there waste in health care? Again, this is not me, kid who grew up in Wyoming and doesn't know any better, um, uh, you know, speculating. This is the national data. One of my favorite observers of health care at all is Don Berwick, who was a director, a very frustrated director of CMS for a couple of years at the end of the Obama administration. And Don, um, who's a very solid professor at Harvard in his own right, and his team have reviewed about 75 peer-reviewed articles on the costs of healthcare and, and whether the drugs, the surgical interventions, the annual exams, all of those things made the patient better off. And it's, they've determined that for all of those articles that they reviewed, 
34% of the money spent on healthcare was wasted. It was not in any way uh, responsible for benefiting the patient. In fact, about 10% of that made the patient worse off. So we're looking at representing providers that are working hard, and I love them dearly, and I make that point in the, in the book. Um, I'm a medical school professor for 20 of my 50 years. Um, I'm not some outsider taking pot shots. I like American medicine, but we can do better, and we can do better by eliminating the waste. And this waste exists because Congress was willing to spend more and more money every year. Our employers were willing to spend more and more money every year. So in my concluding slides, I'm really boiling this down to the last five minutes here. I was, before we moved from Chicago up to Madison two years ago, um, I was running, getting ready for a 5K race in Chicago, and, and I saw this SUV, and I said, that's healthcare. Healthcare is just like an SUV. You know, our hospitals, our medical groups, our drug companies, are these big bloated things, overloaded with stuff we don't need, and expensive, hard to park, you name that. So imagine, if you will, getting to the same destinations with a scooter or a smart car. It works just as well. Now, every once in a while, you're going to need the SUV, your tertiary hospital you know, up on the hill. But imagine how much of healthcare could be done with telemedicine, with nurse practitioners and clinical pharmacists that cost half what a physician costs. And believe me, the numbers are in my book, and I, and I think they're pretty irrefutable. And I found hundreds of people supporting this. It's not just me. Well, you might think that I got a great graphics artist. This is what I actually saw when I was running. <laughs> Somebody gets it. This, this is the Diversi Marina, which is 38 bucks a night to park in. And somebody says, hey, you know, I can, we, we'll, we'll split. I expect the guy on the scooter probably drove in for free, but the, um, we'll leave that aside. So what we've got in healthcare, and this is the issue that I'm prepared to address this afternoon, you want to, is all of these consolidations. As people are finding these cost pressures and discovering it's changing, we have the hospital systems um, uh, developing all these horizontal mergers. We have the insurance companies developing all these horizontal mergers. What do they do? They just shoot at each other. They're going to kill each other because they forget the uh, first law of parasitism. Don't kill the host that feeds you. What we've got going on, and I speak to insurance companies, I speak to health providers, you know, and I tell them this all the time. These are my slides for them, not, not, not made just for you. That they have to start working it out because if you stop and think about it, an insurance company's out of business the minute it puts all the hospitals out of business. So we have to come up with a better way. 25 out of 100 won't, but that'd be that. What we need to do is think vertically. We need to start thinking as partnerships of everybody along the way, of the providers, of the billers, of all of these other things, and begin to develop new systems. And I think 35% of the people in the business are going to be quite capable of that. And I got real excited by the foundations that I know are already being laid. But you got to be at the table. I love this saying, if you aren't at the table, you're on the menu. So that just reinforces the importance of you getting together and figuring out how to use the data to get healthier patients to spend less money on healthcare and the like. So my last two content slides really say that you providers and the people that are responsible for getting their bills paid and, and, and the like, um, purchases, payers, everybody in that vertical line, have to get to the table, come up with a positive vision, which Medicare has never had. I don't, I, I, it's just less gloom, not anything positive and how you're going to optimize population health with existing resources. You're going to have to get there together and figure out how you can use your databases to not dispense the drugs that do harm or don't do any good, to not provide the surgical procedures that don't make the patient better off. All of those things that really excite me as a real healthcare data geek, if you will. And you're going to have to do that in multi-stakeholder partnerships because there's no way you can do it in the, ver in the horizontal relationships. It's got to be partnerships. And I've come to that conclusion as strongly as any over the last couple of years. And that's my message when I speak to medical group leaders, hospital boards, C uh, chief executive officer, chief financial officer, uh, you know, hospital groups, is you've got to think vertically. And what I saw this morning is thinking vertically, even though I didn't know that that was going to be the Cario story. So that's really exciting. And it's really what matters. And again, if you say, well, he just made that up. I've been writing about this. It's interesting. The American Hospital Association came to me and said, Bauer, we need somebody to write an article on, horizontal, on vertical partnerships. Could you do it? Got it into him in a week because it's you know, right there in my head. So that gets me pretty excited, and that leads me to my final slide. This was the other graphic in my dorm room uh, back at Colorado College 55 years ago. It's to look at the egg and imagine what you can make fly, not having somebody else dictate it to you, but to have that vision of creating something neat 
and I see in a remarkable amount of coll collective vision, and I really look forward to exploring it with all of you uh, that want to come to that session in the afternoon. I have already discovered from my morning meetings that you seem to come in groups. There are several of you. From, so spread out. I'm not asking everybody to come to my presentation, because quite frankly, I'd like to go to the other two, but uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be really looking forward to engaging in discussion with you. I'll also be at lunch, and you can stick around a little afterwards. And again, I'm an economist and a weatherman, so I'm not the font of all wisdom, but I'm here to get real excited about energizing you in these partnerships and changing the way data flow through the healthcare system so that the dollars give everybody a bang for the buck. Thank you very much. Thank you.